Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Debt has become a huge problem in today's world. The United States debt clock is constantly ticking and constantly growing. As I sat down to write my sermon this week, the U.S. debt clock sat at $22 trillion. This means every baby born in the United States should be handed a bill for $68,460 because that's the amount that it would take for each citizen to pay to take that number down to zero. Apart from the national debt, each average American household carries on its head upwards of $5,700 in debt. At this moment, there is roughly $1.26 trillion of U.S. student loan debt floating around, with the average monthly payment being $351. Only 35% of credit card holders pay off their balance at the end of each month, with the average American holding $4,717 in credit card debt. It seems now, more than ever, that our society has normalized itself to holding a negative in the balance sheet, or perhaps I'm just becoming more aware of this as I have to do my own ledger keeping and have to start budgeting as we bring a baby into the household. But really, this morning in our gospel text, we learn that debt has always been a hot topic. We begin with the rich man, who is a respected man in the community. It's very possible that he owns a lot of land. He rents a lot of that land out to sharecroppers, and in the process, he employs quite a large number of people. He has so many assets, in fact, that he is a manager on staff to handle the day-to-day operation of his affairs. And unfortunately, like so many who have come after him, this particular manager has sticky fingers, and he has squandered away the wealth of his employer. Perhaps he embezzled these funds to finance a lifestyle beyond his own means. Maybe he took the family to Disney World on vacation, and maybe it's possible that he's just not that good at business. But whatever the excuse, however, the chickens have come home to roost, and the rich man has been tipped off that something has gone very wrong, and the time has come to audit the books. So the wealthy landowner sends his manager away and says, come back with your ledgers. It's time to see what kind of a mess you've made. And so with the pink slip looming over his head, the manager heads to his office to retrieve his checkbook. But the manager is a smart and self-aware man who knows that if he's tossed out onto the street, he will face certain death. There was no pension program, no unemployment benefits, He knew that he wasn't strong enough for manual labor, and he couldn't swallow his pride enough to go out and beg, so he comes up with a third alternative. He says, I'll doctor the accounts, and I'll make a few friends at the same time. He knows that if his notice is coming, and that if he's tossed out into the street, that he's going to need a place to stay. So he calls in the debtors of his master's estate and tells them to lower their debt amounts. He says, let's renegotiate your rental contract. And it's important to note that this was no small sum. Scholars estimate that today it would be about $250,000 that he shaved off of these IOUs. But that $250,000 wasn't unnoticeable. Certainly his master wouldn't be satisfied With that, even if the outstanding debt was substantially less than what it had been, but nonetheless, he makes the necessary adjustments and he prints off an up-to-date ledger and brings it back to the master and he waits for his all-but-certain fate of unemployment. And this is where we would bring down the gavel on our poor manager. This is where we'd stand in judgment and hand down a verdict of guilty, sending him out into the streets because he had done wrong. But this isn't the way that the story ends. No, our Lord Jesus throws us a curveball. Of the 55 parables recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, perhaps this one is the one that turns us upside down the most because justice isn't served. In fact, the rich man commends his manager for being so shrewd. 
It's inconceivable. A, a dishonest manager buries himself in more deception to get ahead and he's rewarded? What's going on here? Dear friends, let's take a closer look at Jesus' words. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. Did Jesus say the master commended the man for his dishonesty? Did he say the master commended the man for being so crooked? No. He applauds him for being shrewd, which means wise. He applauds him because he was able to think critically and make a roadblock disappear for his ability to navigate obstacles. And then the rich man says, you took your cue from the people of the world rather than a cue from believers, and for this I commend you. And at first glance, we're a little perplexed by this conundrum. We think, well, what's so different about the people of this world? Well, the bottom line is that the people of this world know how to use their money to keep what they want. A nice life for themselves. They invest in the 401k. They put some money away for their golden years. They save for the new car. They clothe their children and they put food on the table, all of which is to be commended. But the problem doesn't lie in saving or in throwing all that they have towards keeping their respectable lives for themselves, but rather the problem is in their stewardship. The world uses their money to go out and achieve their goals, and this is to be acclaimed. But the problem is that their management of God's gifts does not add up. Because, you see, you and I are like a manager who has suddenly found themselves in debt. You and I are like a manager who has been gifted with time, with talent, with money, you and I are like a manager who has been tasked with taking care of the gifts that our master has given us, but you and I are also like the manager in the parable who squander away what we have been given. We keep our talents and abilities hidden so that we don't have to work hard. When we're asked to volunteer for a good cause or to come to the table for the betterment of others in the community, we cower because it's inconvenient with our schedules. We keep our money hidden as to not have to share it with the charity down the street or with the church. We keep our time hidden, always saying that we are too busy to help when really all we want to do is sit on the couch and binge watch Netflix on the weekend. And believe me, I've been there and I've said that. Our master commends us on being like those in the world who work for what they have. He commends us for working our fingers to the bone to protect our well-being, but then he convicts us and says, but you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and your selfishness. So our master calls us into the corporate office and asks to take a look at our book so that he can make an audit of our time and our talent and our money, and then we quiver because we know what's coming. And in that moment, we're ready to accept our punishment. In that moment, we're ready to be thrown into prison as a fraud. In that moment, we're ready to have to repay the restitution for what we lost. But instead, we are shown mercy. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ didn't just cancel some of our debt. He took it all on himself spilling his blood so that we can know pardon. The master in our parable could have thrown the manager into the gutter. He also could have prosecuted him. But what did he do instead? He wiped the debt clean. Nowhere in this parable does it say that the manager was actually fired. He was convicted. His sin was shown to him. You cannot be manager. He was leveled by the law. But then the manager heard these words, you are commended, and you acted wisely. And then he issues a warning and a call to repentance. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with a lot, and whoever is dishonest with a very little can be dishonest with a lot. Just as people in this old world are shrewd or wise so they can hold on to their well-being, so too we are called as the church to be shrewd or wise so we can support 
the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ so we can share that same gospel that shows us mercy when we find ourselves in the place of the dishonest manager. We are called to shrewdness and stewardship, not as our justification before God, but because it is our duty to send his life-breathing word out into the world to those who are wallowing in the debt of their own sin. So I could stand here today and give a big barn burner of a sermon on stewardship. I could wag my finger and pound my fist and tell you that you have to give more and be more and do more. But that's not why you've called me to be pastor here at this church. You've called me here to be pastor to preach the gospel and share in the sacraments. I could stand here and scold you or I could commend you because the plain and simple fact is that I'm proud to be your pastor and I'm privileged to be standing here and I'm excited to see what we can do with our time, talents, and tithes. Instead of harassing you, I'll call you to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ who brings us to repentance and then promises to provide for our every need. Instead, I'll call you to stewardship of all that God has given you, to shrewdness as you make a ledger of the hours in your week and the talents that you have been given and the money that you have. And then I'll have you audit the account and withdraw from it out of love for your neighbor and out of love for God, for the gospel. The gospel, the word of promise that cancels our debt. No questions asked, no IOU required. Be shrewd. Be wise. Amen.